human rights is viewed as a challenge to popular song. It's something harmful, possible. Even if the people wants to respect human rights, it's up for people to read it, to, to decide, re decide anew. Every new people, basically, after new, each new election, anything should be open for discussion because this is a system of popular sovereignty, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, uh, I, I try to convey sort of a, a mentality about, about how to think about what, what power is. And I think it depends a little bit on what kind of system one comes from. If, if one comes from a system of where, where the power is um, used against the people, in a sense, when there's a feeling that you need the Constitution to protect you, you, you the people, as individuals, from the misuse of power. I think human rights has a certain connotation, it has a certain ideas connected to it, that we think about human rights as a way to protect us from the people in power. If you instead think, we have the power, then, then there isn't much need for, for, for human rights in a sense. This is a fallacy, I mean, it's not, it's, it, it, because there's always a need for a protection. Uh, because we cannot always trust, I think that's a little bit of what history teaches us, not least in, in Germany, in the 1930s, we learned that maybe there are problems with this kind of system. So the power, uh, that having a strong power in, in Parliament is not necessarily a perfectly good thing, because it can easily turn into a dictatorship uh, of the majority, imposed on the minority, but, but, but that is the kind of system we have. I put in parentheses there, in reality our power lies in government, because Parliament rarely gets very much involved. In, we, we elect a parliament, and the parliament elects government, and then generally the parliament does whatever the government tells them to do. There's very little conflict, there's very little division of power in reality uh, between the government and the parliament. Uh, sometimes people demeaningly call parliament Rostningsbuskop, which means like, uh, um, like a voting herd, like a herd of animals, you know? They're basically there to vote the way that the party leaders tell them to vote. Um, it's a little bit mean, but it's, there is a little bit of truth in it, that the parliament has, has a very weak role. Um, so, in a sense, we, we have a, a rather weak, outdated constitution. I don't think... Uh, most Swedish uh, scholars or lawyers would disagree with this. We simply don't care that much. Um, even in law school, we don't really pay that much attention to the Constitution. The field of constitutional law has largely been taught. In most Swedish law schools, it's mostly been taught by people that were more interested in political science. So the Constitution was more viewed as a, a field of political science rather than law itself. Uh, so it focuses quite a lot on parliamentary procedure and these kind of things that maybe, maybe political scientists are more interested in. Uh, voting systems and that kind of things. And constitutional issues more like hardcore constitutional legal issues like division of power or human rights protection has largely been overlooked. I'm a little bit simplifying, but it's, it's been a very weak thing. Um, Constitutional arguments have been viewed as, as something that troublemakers engage in. Most lawyers, for at least leading up to about the year 2000, and maybe even today in Swedish courts, if you appear in front of a judge and you try to say, but judge, the Constitution says something, you will almost be laughed out of the court. You're, you're, you're viewed more or less as, as a troublemaker. The, the, the Constitution is not really there in order to be, be relied upon in, in, in court. It's, it's a nice document. It's, it's supposed to be descriptive. It describes to generally how the legal system, how the, the system, country is set up, but it's not really supposed to be used as a legal argument. It's, it's not really a, a enforceable legal uh, document in that sense. Again, I'm, over, I'm simplifying a little bit, but I think uh, uh, this has been uh, a quite pervasive view um, until very, very, very recently, in the last five, ten years. Um, it, it's, it's seen almost not serious, 
for a lawyer to stand up in front of a Swedish judge and, and, and recite an article of the Constitution. Um, Sweden has a system of decentralized judicial review. Do you know what this means? No? Okay. So basically, um, judicial review, the, the review where courts go in and make sure that the uh, policymakers, legislators, and so on, the other uh, entities exercising government powers, uh, follow the rules of the Constitution which we call judicial review, broadly speaking, uh, can be done in two ways. You can either do it in a centralized way, where you have a specialized court, or possibly specialized court, several, that, that are like constitutional courts. Is there a constitutional court in Nepal? There's a constitutional bench. Okay, so it, it's a, like a bench, a part of the, the Supreme Court? Okay, so it is, a, 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 in a sense, a, a constitutional court, yes. So in Sweden, this is not true. Every single court can exercise judicial review. In fact, every single court shall exercise judicial review. So in any level of court, in the local district court, we have uh, general courts and we have administrative courts, basically a dual court system. Um, you are supposed to, to, they are supposed to enforce the constitution. So for example, if a law, if the judge has a law in front of them, and the, 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 uh, the lawyer comes in front of the court and says, Judge, I know what the, the legislation, the legislative act says, but you shall not apply it in this case because it violates our constitution. Each judge, immediately of it, him, his or her own uh, uh, power, shall disapply the law. So I, sh I cannot apply this law because it is unconstitutional. So the same applies for every single government official. So I'm a government official when I grade uh, student papers, when I give uh, grades to students, I'm exercising public authority. Is that th true here too? I'm looking at the teachers because I imagine they might. Yeah. So I'm acting, I'm acting as a government entity. And if I find, for example, that the, the, the legislative act that controls the university system is in violation of constitution, I shall ignore the, the, the act governing. I, 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 I shall set the grade in, in conformity with the Constitution, not in, in conformity with the statute. So let's say we had a, um, a very offensive act saying um, all students from Denmark, to use a previous example, shall, shall, shall fail all classes. Let's say that's the, the legislative act that's being passed by Parliament. As a grader, I shall by myself say, I will ignore this because this is in violation of our constitution. I will give this person a pass or a high pass because that is the grade that they deserve. So on paper, this is quite good. It's a, it's a very strong paper, system of judicial review because it empowers every single official, judges, but also other type of public officials to enforce the constitution by themselves in each individual case. I don't have to send it up to like a constitutional court. I shall do it on the local level immediately, which is also another advantage. Right? Who will decide whether it's constitutional or not? I will, I will decide if it's constitutional or not. As, at me, myself, yes. So as a government official, I have the duty. But of course then, let's say I say, no, 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 this is fine. We can, we, it, it, I think it's in conformity with the constitution to fail all Danish students, right? The Danish student might take me to court, and then there, it, would be a, you know, it would be appealable in a sense. So finally the court. Finally the court, if it is appeal. But but let's say I decide. If I decide, you're right, Danish student, you will get a high pass. Nobody will appeal this, right? Because I will not appeal it, the university will not appeal it, and the student will not appeal it, and it will stand, in a sense. So it gives a lot of, it empowers the, the local judges and the local public authorities quite a lot. Um, do you understand how this works? But, uh, is yep. that not a bit uh, contradictory yeah. to what you said uh, before? Uh, right now you're talking uh, about constitutional supremacy. Mm. Um, uh, a bit earlier you told that uh, while uh, using arguments uh, based on constitution in court, uh, it would be a matter of uh, laughter or something like that. Right, exactly. And so, and so, because of this, because of this, it rarely happens. In reality, we very rarely do this. Right, yes. Because so we have a culture of not exercising these powers. 
And so most judges wouldn't, even even if like the, it's pointed out, this is blatantly violation of the Constitution. I, you know, <laughs> it's it's just the Constitution. I maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but so it, it looks very good on paper that we all have this kind of power, and it has the 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 promise in a sense of 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 being a very forceful mechanism for in, in, in enforcing the Constitution. But because we have this, this culture of not doing so, because we have a very, very strong culture of respecting parliament, uh, it is quite weak in reality. So the, the, there are some types of institutional controls here that could be very good for enforcing human rights and other constitutional provisions. But, but they're quite rarely exercised. And even when they are exercised by our even when they are exercised by our highest courts, we have two highest courts. We have the Supreme Court and the Supreme Administrative Court. And they are, they are on equal footing, in a sense. Uh, they just deal with different kinds of matters. The administrative courts deal with matters of public law, particularly administrative law, and all else, all other matters, criminal and civil, are dealt with by the Supreme Court as a court of last instance. Even when these, our highest courts, engage truly in judicial review, when they set aside a law and say, we will not apply this law because it's unconstitutional, they are heavily criticized. And so we've had a discussion uh, over the last couple of years, a very public discussion in the law reviews between the judges of the highest uh, Supreme Courts and some constitutional lawyers that are in support of stronger judicial control on one hand. And on the other hand, people that are more traditionalist, including many of the other judges, so many of the lower judges have written very, very critical art articles criticizing the Supreme Court of Sweden for exact exercising its judicial review. Um, basically, they're saying, you are taking the power, I'm, I'm simplifying here, but the, the argument is basically, you are taking the power of the people. Because the, you are not elected. It's very important to remember. Judges are not elected officials. Who are you to think that you know better than Parliament, who is directly elected by the people, what the rules should be, you know? And when you're saying, we will not enforce this rule, for example, who are you to say this, these things? There is not that kind of legitimacy. So we have a, there's a very great reverence in the Swedish legal system and among Swedish lawyers for the legislature. I'll give you an example of this because because the dean said I could speak for as long as I, I want to, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll do a little excursion. Um, one of the most uh, important legal sources in Sweden is the preparatory works. You know what these are? Uh, huh? Yeah, sort of. I don't know if you you use these kind of documents here, but it's basically when a new uh, legislative act is enacted by parliament, they produce a lot of different documents leading up to this. It usually starts with uh, some kind of... Um, developed paper, in a sense. It's usually like a book that is commissioned. So the, the parliament usually commissions a group of experts to write, like a, to investigate an issue, and they come out with a book where they say, this is what we have investigated. This is then sent out across the country and people can comment on it. And this is then put into a bill. And, and in the end, you know, there's a lot of different documents that goes into this. So these we call the preparatory works because they're all the works, the, all the papers that are produced in preparing the actual legislative acts. So anyway, the legislative acts are very, of, of course, the, the, the acts that people can see, the law printed and published and take, uh, adopted by parliament are very important. But usually our legislative acts are very general. They're, they're very short and they use a rather general language. They're not very detailed. In order to understand what, what is actually meant, what the law, what the legislative act means on more detailed matters, you consult the preparatory works. And judges love preparatory works. So they, they, they go through these and see, well, what did parliament mean? And what did parliament mean on this? What did they want us to do? And what does this term mean? So in reality, to understand what the law is, it's, it, you can argue that the preparatory works are one of the most important legal sources out there. And sometimes, judges go so far that they use, they, they interpret, they will enforce the preparatory works even when the legislative acts says something else. 
the le there are examples like that where the Legislative Act really seemed to say this is not a criminal offense. But if you read the preparatory words, you understand that it was probably meant. And the court says, okay, you couldn't understand it from the Legislative Act itself, but it's right here in the preparatory words. Which is a very extreme position, right? I mean, in the sense, it's, there, there are big problems with that because it's not foreseeable for, for the everyday people what really what is a criminal offense because normal people don't read preparatory works. They might be able to read and, and understand what the legislative act says, but they don't read the preparatory works. The Swedish constitutional tradition uh, has one exception in a sense, to what I said before, that we have a rather weak constitutional tradition, which is the Freedom of the Press Act, enacted first in 1766. And this is, I think, one of, one of the, the, the first constitutions in the world recognizing uh, some of these basic liberal freedoms, as we call them, the political freedoms, democratic freedoms, I don't know, there are many words to describe these, but the basic, the basic freedom of people there to ensure a democratic system. Freedom of assembly, uh, right to vote, the freedom of speech, and so on. Um, on, the, on the right there, I have the, the picture of the, uh, the French Declaration of the Universal Rights of Men, which I think is a little bit before, a little bit after the 1766 Act. Um, so this this came around um, at a time when this is basically, I would say, one of the first steps that we had towards uh, from the, the absolute royal sovereignty towards the system that we have today. So in 1766, um, Parliament, as it was then, even though the king was, was still the, the very much the, the person in power, uh, was trying to promote freedoms. We call this the Age of Freedom, Frihetsfrieden in Swedish. Um, and this is, a, this is a short interval, basically, where we had kings that, that were um, very promoting of, of these basic to, to make uh, society more free, more liberal, and, and to involve people more in government. Um, and we have, we have updated the text a little bit since 1766. There was also a, a brief period when it was suspended. But more or less, we have today, this is still one of our constitutional documents. Sweden doesn't have one constitution. Maybe that's also an oddity about Sweden. A lot of countries, when you think about a constitution, you maybe think about one document. Like the US Constitution, it's one document that you can hold. So we don't have any document really that is called the Constitution, capital T, capital C. Instead, we have several different documents that have constitutional status. By this, I mean that they are particularly difficult to, to change. There's a particularly uh, rigorous system where you have to have a vote in Parliament, and then an election, and then another vote. And so the idea is that the people in exercising their power during the election will be able to control Parliament from changing these documents. They're also special in the regard that they are supposed to be superior, that, they're, that they, they go, in case of conflict, they, they take superiority over the other type of legislative acts. So, yes? Can you, uh, once again, give it like... Uh what, what, like, since you said that there are many uh, constitutional documents, not just one uh, yeah. constitution, so how do you amend these uh, uh, documents, like, uh, since you said that there are special measures uh, right. for these particular documents, right. what is the process? So the process is that, that uh, first, you have to, you need to, it needs to be approved by two parliaments, basically. So you, you first, if, if they want to change the, uh, one of these constitutional documents, uh, Parliament has to first pass up one vote, and then we have all the popular election, and we replace them with the new Parliament, and the new Parliament has to approve the decision by the previous Parliament. Um, I, I guess it could no, you, it could be quicker if you do it at the end. If you do it at the end of one Parliament, you could be quite quick about it. You know, in theory, I guess you could you could get it down to 
five, six months, if you're lucky, you know, in, in, the, in terms of when in time this is. Um, and so the control here, I think, I think the reason why we have this kind of system, but it only requires a single majority vote. You don't in some, I know in some countries it requires maybe two-thirds majority or three-quarters majority. It only requires a single majority vote. And I think if I were to explain why it is this way, is because we believe in popular sovereignty, right? So a majority of the people should be allowed to do anything it wants. So um, if a majority of the people elects representative in parliament that chooses to change the constitution, it should be free to do so. And it could be anything. I know that it, some constitutions, like for example the German constitution, has certain articles like the respect of human dignity that cannot be changed. They're, they are unchangeable. There is nothing like this in the Swedish constitution. I think it would be it would be very difficult for people to even understand that kind of idea that there could be something like this because we believe so firmly in popular sovereignty. But instead, we try to have this kind of measure with like an election. So if if Parliament has has decided to really undermine human rights in a way not supported by the people, people have then the chance in the election to choose a new Parliament that won't approve these type of radical changes. Um, we have we have four such sort of constitutional documents. It's this act, Turikfrihetsförordningen in Swedish, uh, the Free Book Press Act. There is uh, another act that is quite similar that was taken, uh, which is PREP that protects specifically the freedom of expression, like other type of freedoms of expression, not in print. So we have like a, one special legislative act for printing and another one for, for other types of expression. And this is maybe also a little bit of a curiosity in a sense. But, but it goes back to the, the fundamental idea that the printing press, when the printing press came around, um, the, the press has a very particularly important role in upholding democracy to um, scrutinize, the, the, now I mean press, not just as the printing press, but I mean the press as media, has a very important role when it comes to scrutinizing government and, and scrutinizing the use of public authority, and also a, a very important role in, in, in leading public debates. At least this was the traditional view. So that is why the, the printed work was very much elevated. You couldn't go around saying anything. In 1766, you could basically print whatever you wanted. There was an almost absolute protection against censorship of printing. But you could still be criminally charged if you went around, you know, having a discussion with friends orally in, in a cafe and saying, you know, shouldn't we, I think the king is terrible, we, we, need a, we need to implement a republic here. You couldn't say that, but you could print it. Maybe that's an oddity too, but there was like this idea that there is something different. There's something different about the printed work. We're trying to, to, to change and uphold the democracy and strengthen democracy. So it has a very elevated protection. The, the third act that has this kind of constitutional status is what we call the Act of Parliament, which in reality is the one that looks most like a constitution. This is the document that, that, that uh, establishes the other, other public entities, the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judicial branch. It is uh, the one that lays down the basic rules for judicial review. It holds the protection for every other type of human right except the, the, um, the, the, these, the, the, the freedom of the press and the freedom of expression, other type of expressions. Uh, every other type of human right gets its protection from the Act of Parliament. So that, that's the closest thing to we have to a constitution, like capital C constitution. And then the fourth act, which is a very strange act, is the one that regulates who gets to become the next monarch after this one. So it's the act of succession. So when our current king dies or chooses to step down, this constitutional act governs who, who gets to rule uh, next. Because we don't really care about the king, we don't really care about this constitutional act. It doesn't matter very much. Uh, at least in the ancient practice, this is not. It's, it's a little bit strange in the fact that that's one of the constitutional documents, but, but it is. Um, so the Freedom of the Press Act, uh, which, which has changed a little bit over time, uh, but basically is the same today as it was in 1766. 
uh, contain some very basic freedoms. One of these freedoms is, of course, the freedom of expression. And now I mean like the freedom to express in print something. So it establishes a system where every type of publication has a person responsible. So each newspaper has a, uh, has a responsible publisher, and they need to be named. So on the front side of every Swedish paper, it will say, this is the individual that is legally responsible for everything that you read in these in, on these papers. If anything in there is a crime, this is the person that goes to prison, no one else. And this is a way also to ensure uh, that anybody is allowed to give information to, to a, a paper. People write like an opinion piece, if you write like a, 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 a you know what this is, like, a, like an editorial or something like this. It is the, they can say basically whatever they want and they are protected by this law. If, if they violate any type of legal act, it is the publisher that goes to prison. If they publish, um, if they publish um, state secrets, it is the publisher that goes to prison. <laughs> but it's, it's basically then creates a system where it is up to the, 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 the people responsible for printing newspapers and books. They are the ones that are responsible, which also then encourages, in a sense, a system uh, of, of publishing more, in a sense. They are sometimes careful with what they publish, because they don't want to go to prison either, but, 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 but it basically gives a very great power to anyone to, to give information to these papers. Um, this includes a type of protection for whistleblowers. Um, so if I, as a government, let's say I, I, I find out that the, uh, that the head of the educational department is stealing money from the government, I can go to the press, I can go to a newspaper, and I can tell them this. And they are not allowed to reveal where they have their source. But also, the government is not even allowed to look for the source. So if a government official, if the police then comes knocking on my boss's door and think, we think you have a leak in this department, the policeman can go to prison. Just for, just for inquiring who might have leaked this information. If I write like an anonymous um, editorial, this happens sometimes in my local newspaper, that, that uh, people from the university write something critical about the university in the newspaper. Does this happen here? No. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the teachers are just very happy. But, but this happens quite frequently, that somebody will write to the newspaper, and they write like an anonymous, anonymous piece in the newspaper that says, oh, this is terrible, the, 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 the president of the university doesn't know what he's doing, and this is, this is all very inefficient use of taxpayer money. The, 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 the president of the university and any other kind of government official are absolutely forbidden from even trying to find out who wrote this. If they try to find out who that does this, they might go to prison for that alone. No matter if they did something wrong or not. So there's a very strong protection in the sense for whistleblowers of this kind. But probably the, 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 strongest, uh, the strongest protection for these liberal freedoms we find in the freedom of information. As a general rule, all documents that are sent to a public entity, and Sweden has, has a quite big government, so we have many different kinds of public entities. Any type of document that is sent to, that arrives at a public entity, is public. Anybody can go in and ask to have a copy of a public document. Uh, the same applies to any kind of document that was created in a government entity. So if a government entity has created a document or they have received a document, and document is here defined loosely, so it includes actually, the course have said, this includes basically like a, a DVD, like video or pictures or anything that can be understood or read in a sense, is a document. And once it arrives at a court or a public authority of any kind, it is, it is a matter of public record. And anybody can go in and request it. And the government cannot even ask who you are. That's a crime itself. So if you go and it says, I'd like to get these documents. I heard that this government, you have uh, produced documents about corruption, let's say, inside the, the university. I keep on using university as an example, but that's because I worked there. It could be, it could be anything. So I hear that there is a document that you put together. I want a copy. They cannot even ask, who are you? They just have to say, yes, sir. And they go and make a copy and they give it to you. 
Um, there are some limitations to this. Some, some things can become secret, right? They can determine that this is secret, but these are quite narrowly defined, what can be labeled a secret act. Uh, in real, and you can sometimes redact like individual information. So I cannot go, for example, to a hospital and get somebody's hospital records. But I can, for example, go to the government and get somebody else's tax records. I don't know if that is true here. I know this has been a big discussion in the United States. People want Donald Trump. I don't know if you follow American politics. But normally, the president, as a matter of courtesy in a sense, releases his, his tax documents. and says, OK, here are my tax documents. This is how much I learned. This is how much I paid in taxes. In Sweden, it's not even an issue, because anyone can walk in from the street, go to the tax stores. I'd like to get the president's tax documents, please. So okay. it's a good place to have one of Julian Assange. To? Julian Assange. Uh, Julian Assange, yeah. yes. He liked Sweden for a while, until he was accused of, of rape, that he didn't like Sweden. Uh, then he said, oh, it's a very corrupt state. You don't want to be there. I, I think there might be other issues in that case. Um, but, but it is, and that, that is one of the reasons. In fact, he made a mistake, though, Julian Assange, yeah. because he, 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 used, he used the whistleblower protection in a sense. But if he had set up a publication, because uh, uh, WikiLeaks, you know WikiLeaks? Yeah. WikiLeaks was never set up as a proper publication. But if he had set it up as, let's say, an online newspaper, and he would say, I'm the responsible publisher for this newspaper, he, he would have gotten much better, stronger protection because of this act from 1766. Then he would say, okay, now we, there are certain limitations. Now we can't even, he is the only one that can be legally responsible under Swedish law. So like if somebody gives information to his newspaper, if he set it up as a newspaper under the law, we would be forbidden from making any kind of investigation into where they might have, what their sources might be. So I think that was a mistake on, on his behalf. Um, so, yes, so this, this general access, this principle, the freedom of information in the sense of access to public documents, are very, very strong in Sweden. You can argue that this is our strongest constitutional right. This is our, one of our most <laughs> fundamental principles. And there are many other incredibly strong human rights that are not at all protected in our constitution. In fact, I don't think, for example, we have an article for, for uh, a prohibition against slavery, if, if memory serves me. Which may seem strange, like, so we say, of course we don't have slavery. We haven't had slavery. I don't know if we actually ever had slavery. But we have no legal, you know, in our own constitution, there are other provisions protecting from this. But, but, but for the longest time, there was nothing in the law specifically for forbidding people from having slaves. Yet there was a very strong belief in this, in this, this access to doc public documents. Um, which might, in many countries, seem like a rather uh, technical issue, maybe. I don't know. I mean, in, in a more like a, a rather new thing. Um, I've done a lot of comparisons with the United States, so I know a little bit more of that. But, um, I think it was during the time of Bill Clinton that they enacted the Freedom of Information Act, which gives some access, was supposed to increase access to public documents. Not to this extent, but, but a little bit more than this. Um, Sweden have had a lot of conflict with the European Union, because the European Union doesn't have this principle of access to documents to the same extent that Sweden does, which has led to some interesting conflicts. Any type of document in, within the European Union, there are quite a lot of documents that are not open to public access. For example, political documents, or documents that are created or communicated between the member states as part of the political system. Yet, as soon as, as it arrives at the Swedish ministry, it's usually the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that receives these documents, it becomes a public document in Sweden because the access to documents are very very, uh, it's very strong in Sweden, right? So we can't say, well, you see, this is an EU document. We want a general exception from this. No, no, this is protected in this constitutional document and enjoys very strong protection and very old protection. <coughs> it's almost sacred. So for example, I, had a, I have a colleague that I do research with who uh, wanted to study the documents that different countries send to the European Court of Justice. Uh, which is, I'll, I'll get back to the European Court of Justice soon, but um, whenever there's a court proceeding, the member states basically say it, send a letter saying what they think in this matter. 
And inside the European Union, these are secret. It's not part of the proceedings themselves. So you can't uh, get access to them. So first he asked the Court of Justice, can I get these documents? I said, no, 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 they're secret. But then he found out that each country also sends a copy to the other countries. So he found out that there are copies of all these documents in Stockholm in the Swedish Department of Justice. And so he went there and says, can I have a copy? Of course you can, sir. And he went and gave him a copy of these documents. Uh, and they, they were too... But you have a classified documents, right? There are some classified documents, yes. You, there are certain documents that can be classified well, this is by law. regulated by law. But, but it's a quite narrow exception. And many of these exceptions are there to, to protect not the government, but individuals. So you can, for example, uh, redact names of individuals. If you want, let's say, a, a judgment that is about like a minor child, you can get the document, but they will strike out the name of the child to protect the child. But usually not the government. There are some, like like really like military secrets and so on, but it's it's a very narrow exception. So, and I think it's important to understand this. You, this this long background, um, I think, is important to understand how we then uh, interact with other kind of human rights um, that I here call the second generation. If you, I, I, there, are, there are different kinds of classifications, but often we talk about these liberal freedoms, the democratic freedoms as the first generation rights, and then we have a, 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 the well, second generation. Here, in our context, they highly criticize these generations. I think. Yes. Okay, okay, so it's, it's, it's not, it's, people don't like to talk about but, it. But okay. that's, that's, that's okay. No yeah, I, I don't have a strong yes. opinion, it's, yeah. just a, it's just a word that I use here. Uh, but, but so basically these, these other rights then, all the rights that are not part of these democratic liberal freedoms dating back to the Enlightenment in, in the French philosophers, all of these rights quickly, they, 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 they are a question of, of conflict in a sense with our constitutional tradition. Um, and and uh, this is most obvious maybe in the case of the European Convention of Human Rights. Are you familiar with this? Yes. yes. Um, so after World War II, a lot of the different countries sat down and they decided that we need to do something um, uh, to, to protect other rights, not just these fundamental freedoms. At this point, most European nations had some kind of fundamental freedom protection, like Sweden at the time. Um, and they wanted more of these protections. Um, Sweden signed the European Convention of Human Rights quite early. I think we were one of the, the first signatory states to the European Convention of Human Rights. But it was used as a, um, it had the status of a international treaty. Sweden is part of what is called the dualist tradition. Do you know what this means? Yeah? Anybody wants me to explain this? No? Okay, very, very good. Okay, so, so, so for that reason, when we, so, when we signed the European Convention of Human Rights, that didn't mean that people could enforce these rights. So you could go to the court and, yes, Sweden had signed on to these rights, but there was really no way to enforce these in, in the day-to-day -day life. They, they were viewed as something that was nice to have, but, but they were not enforceable legal rights. Uh, and the reason for this was not that Sweden was very worried about living up to these conventions. In fact, we probably overestimated how good we are at human rights, as we still today do. And people are saying, "Yeah, yeah, we don't even need, you know, we, we don't even need to sign this document because we're already so excellent at, at protecting these human rights." People were quite smug about how, how good they were at human rights. Uh, but basically, it says we'll sign on basically as a good example for other countries. That, that was more or less the speech put it in the And uh, there was a, a general discussion at the time, well, if we're going to sign it on, should we also make it part of Swedish law? And Parliament said, no, no, absolutely not. Because it might limit popular sovereignty. So on one hand, we're not really, we, we believe very strongly in these rights. We, in fact, we believe we already respect these rights and more, more than necessary we respect these rights. Uh, but we don't want to sign on by, because it might live in popular sovereignty. Because what might happen, right? Let's say we have an election and the people say we don't, we no longer want to be bound by the European Convention of Human Rights. 
Because according to sort of the classical Swedish tradition, the people have the right to choose to, to, to not respect these rights whenever they want. And if it becomes a very difficult process of leaving the European <laughs> Convention or, or dismantling as, as a rule, um, that, would be, that would be problematic, right? Does this make sense? Or is this, yeah? It's, it's uh, Sweden is part of the European Union, right? Yes. And also, we part of the Euro Euro European Union, the signing of convention is not necessary. It is necessary. It's necessary. Yeah, in order to be a member of the European Union, you must have signed the European Convention of Human Rights. So, that means you cannot leave, or you have to leave the Union. Right. You have to leave, exactly. If you want to leave the convention, you have to leave the Union. Okay. This is actually now an issue in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, because some people want to say, let's stay in the EU, but just leave the European Convention on Human Rights, because they weren't so fond of it. Um, the, uh, the, and they were saying, that's actually an impossibility, in a sense. You're not, you will not be allowed to remain a member of the state if you're not signed out for the European Convention. And I will talk a little bit more about this, because this quickly became very complicated. How are these different types of, of institutions connected to each other? But I actually, now that I'm talking about the United Kingdom, maybe that is a, a, a good way to illustrate the Swedish mentality. Because I think Sweden and the United Kingdom has a lot in common on this ground. In a sense, we have a very, both countries have a pretty good uh, track record when it comes to respecting human rights. We also have very strong belief in parliamentary sovereignty. Both nations have a monarch, but the monarchs don't have a lot of power anymore. The, the, the British Queen has a little bit more power than the Swedish King, but they still are, she's, she has, doesn't have a lot of, of role in, in the, how the country is run anymore. And I think people have a very strong sense of popular sovereignty. There's a very strong, and I think that's a way to understand also now uh, why, what, what is going on in Britain, because it might seem a little bit strange, I think, from the outside. I think it's easier to understand maybe from Sweden's position than many other countries. When they are saying, we don't actually want to be part of, of the European Union, in part because of what the fundamental rights uh, mean. We don't want to be part of the European Convention of Human Rights. We don't want to be bound by these rules. And that sounds like a state that is quickly declining towards a dictatorship or something. But it actually comes from a very different place where they're saying, no, no, we want to take back popular sovereignty. Our democracy has been eroded by giving power to institutions that are not directly responsible to the people. And the only way to do restore democracy and popular sovereignty is to leave these institutions. But how about threat from Russia? How, how we win? Threat, threat. Oh, the threat, threat from, from Russia. Russia. Yeah, that's that's a yeah, and it's hard today. I think it's hard today for any country to be truly sovereign. I think it was a lot easier, you know, 500 years ago when when countries were further apart in a sense, and we didn't have like a lot of global movement. Today, people and economies and and laws are so intertwined. You can, it's very difficult to un. Uh, yeah, to get these un 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 untangled from each other. Um, part of the European Convention of Human Rights system is the European Court of Human Rights, the ECTHR, which is the court in, in Strasbourg that enforces these rights and settles these cases. And I think that's the second thing that Sweden had a problem with. The first thing, like I said, was signing the convention in of itself would limit popular sovereignty because, and by extension, democracy, by, by making it more difficult for people basically to, to step back, to, 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 to um, uh, disengage from the convention itself. But it was also problematic that what the law was, what these rights mean, what the, what the convention articles, how they should be interpreted, would be decided by a court in Strasbourg that is not elected. Like I said, our Swedish courts, are, have this tradition and still today have a tradition where basically they feel that they are very bound by the, by the opinion of the legislator and the, the intention of the legislator and parliament is extremely strong. And so we, we believe that courts should have very li little power in a sense. Courts are necessary, but courts are more or less, again, I'm, I'm very much simplifying here, but courts are, are used much more like a tool for the government than somebody there to check the government, traditionally. 
And so the idea of having a court in, in Strasbourg that is not even a Swedish court, a foreign court in a sense, an international court, that would now sit and tell the Swedish parliament what it can and cannot do, to say, no, no, see, you enacted a law over there. You cannot apply this law because it violates the European Convention of Human Rights. That, that was very fundamentally offensive, I think, to Parliament at the time. I'll give you an example of this uh, from the area of property law, the protection of property rights, that the, the property should not be taken away from them. As I said earlier on, there has been some protection in Swedish law for the property rights, even going back to the 1300s, if you see these oaths taken by the Swedish kings in the 1300s, some of it was actually saying, I will respect that your property is your property. I will not suddenly come and take your house without some kind of due process. But when, um, when the question arose in the Swedish parliament in about 1935 or so, um, it was a very different kind of feeling about it. So in, in the 1930s, uh, when the German uh, Swedish politicians observed what was going on in Germany, the German officials were taking the property of the Jewish population of Germany. They were saying, this is very bad. We, we need to enact some kind of protection under the law, something that protects uh, the, the property of people, that they cannot be taken away. Because at the time, there was nothing in the Swedish constitution that protected this. At this time, in fact, the Swedish constitution simply said, the king has all sovereignty, he has all power, he can do basically whatever he wants. There were, no, there were no really, the only rights we had were the freedom of press. That was the only real freedom protected by the Swedish constitution. And so um, one of the members of parliament, who actually was from the right side of the parliament, one of the, the, the right wingers in the sense of the Swedish parliament, uh, but he was not a Nazi sympathizer at all. He, he very much disliked the Nazis. And he said, you know, we need to enact this kind of, of uh, protection, some kind of fundamental right of property. And uh, Parliament voted him down and said, no, absolutely not, because he would limit popular sovereignty. We will respect it. The government will respect it and, and has respected it for hundreds of years. And we will continue to respect it. But we will not sign into law that this is a human right that he shall have, because that would be a limitation of popular sovereignty. Today, we have signed on to the European Convention of Human Rights, and it does contain a provision about uh, protection of, of property, which has caused a lot of friction, actually. There are, there are some problems there in, 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 tail, in reconciling other type of, of fundamental rights with this right to property. The other question is the, uh, the right to privacy. Right to privacy uh, can very easily come in conflict with the, the traditional uh, freedoms of, of press that I mentioned earlier. So if, if I go, if I have a right to get public documents, that might mean me invading the privacy of some other people, right? So if this document, if these documents contain information about other individuals, there might be a very real chance of me invading their privacy. At the same time, we also think that these, that the, it is very, very fundamental that people should have access to documents, that we should have public debate, that you should be able to express almost anything, especially in print, but today also in other kind of media. Uh, that it's such a fundamental part of democracy and the democratic rights that are so important for upholding democracy, that it easily becomes a conflict. The European Convention usually wants to give more in weighing of these rights the weighing of the, the property rights or the right to privacy against these traditional fundamental, we call them first generation rights. They, they want to balance this more. And in, in the traditional Swedish constitutional tradition, these old liberal freedoms weigh much, much heavier. But this uh, privacy matters information is no, not public document. The, I'm sorry, the, what? It's not a public document, right? What is like it? A, the matters related to privacy. Yeah. Privacy. It's not a public document. Yeah. Exactly. So medical, we have we have a, a secrecy <laughs> or, or a uh, uh, it's classified the, the the document like about your medical records. But I, I mean, uh, how, I, there's a little confusion I found. Okay. Here. Like a privacy, you see. Privacy and then public documents. Right. When you have a right to get a public documents, right. uh, then and then how it contradicts with the privacy. Okay. 
Sure. Uh, so, for example, medical records would not be, because those would be normally protected. But if, if you were living in Sweden, let's say, I could, go to, uh, I could go to the university and I could get all your grades. I could go to the tax authorities and get your tax rates. I could go to uh, the, the, the government entity that keeps track of like, where people live. I, could, I would know who your parents are, who your children are, who your wife is, what address they all live on, if you've been divorced or not. I can find out all of where they went to school, what they, kind of money they have. I can see if you have a car registered. All of these informations are public documents. And, and I also can, you know, I can, I can compile this information, right? And, you know, so so there is there's a lot of documents, but, but there are some documents that would be very difficult to get hold of, like, for example, medical records, because those are classified. So there's a special exception to that kind of document. But because the general rule is that all documents created or that arise at a government entity is public, we, we can get a lot of information that would not be available in most countries in, in uh, Europe. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, do they have demarcations on what kind of issues have to be published or not to be published? Yes. Do they have demarcations or not? What do you for mean example, by demarcations? Uh, for example, I go to the hospitals, for example, mm -hmm. and I get my body checked up. Right so does that information get published to the uh, public officials? Or does, that, does it have to be divulged to you or not? Uh, med medical records, not. Yeah. So, so there are demarcations as what are the things to be yeah, published there, there and is, not to there be is, published. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. The basic rule is that all documents are public documents. Okay. But then there are, are basically uh, a few exceptions for secrecy or, or, or classification. So there's like a list, but it's very short. And, and like medical records is one of them. Uh, but, 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 um, and then a lot of it is deals with like state secrets and military secrets and that kind of thing where you can classify a whole thing. Or if you need to like protect uh, a minor child, like in the case of like uh, uh, a case of sexual abuse or something that would be, you know, problematic if it could come forth. But, but they're quite narrow. And, and also the rule is usually that you have a right to get the document if it's enough to strike like the name of the person. So if you have like a, if you have some other kind of document but it just contains, um, uh, let's say like a, a medical study instead. It's not like your journal, uh, the, the, the file that the doctor keeps about your, like your health. But it's maybe like part of a study. Let's say you're part of a medical study and I say I want to see this medical study. You have a right to see the medical study but they can anonymize. So I don't know which one is you but I have a right to the document. Um, and this, this goes, and, and there is, I mean, there's also a, a, a protection for this within the European Convention of Human Rights, but in many countries, there is a little bit more of a balance here in a sense, that the right to privacy might weigh a little heavier than, than it traditionally has in Sweden, because privacy has been viewed more as, um, as more problematic from this, from the, if you start with the idea that everything is about popular sovereignty and upholding popular sovereignty. And that is our primary um, concern. Privacy is a much secondary issue. I also find that, that uh, uh, I, I have American colleagues, and I've also done work in the US. We have a very different idea of what privacy is there for. So uh, in Europe right now, uh, generally, and especially in Sweden, there is, there, is, um, there is very little protection of privacy from government, but we try to protect privacy from corporations like Facebook and Google and, and Microsoft. We're quite strict on these corporations and saying, you know, you can't use our data in this way, you cannot, you know, sell personal information in certain types of ways, but we're at the same time, public records are very public in a sense, and I think they have a hard time understanding this, because in the US it's, it's kind of the other way around. You know, you can publish a lot of different names and, and, and Facebook and government, uh, Google and Microsoft, they have a lot of possibilities to use your, your, your uh, uh, personal information because it's basically a contract between two individuals. But, but the government, the important thing is that the government doesn't know very much about it. Uh, so we, we have different understandings of what this might mean also. <laughs> How am I uh, doing on time? Are we? Uh, is it is it good? Yeah. Are you used to having a break? Yeah, yes. Do you, do you want a break? Ten minutes. Ten minutes break. Ten minutes. Let's take a ten minutes break. Perfect.
development going back from the earliest Swedish kings in 1300s all the way up to 1995 where we, we moved towards more and more of popular sovereignty and strong emphasis on these uh, uh, liberal freedoms. So two things happened exactly at midnight, January 1st, 1995. The, the first thing was that uh, the European Convention of Human Rights became Swedish law. As I mentioned, Sweden was one of the signatory states of the European Convention of Human Rights very early on. But on January 1st, 1995, it became Swedish law. So uh, this was actually a, one of the, these examples that, that I was going to mention. Um, there was, it was written into the Swedish constitution that the European Convention is part of Swedish law. And because it's also written into the constitution, it, it requires a constitutional <coughs> a constitutional change now to leave the convention in a sense. It is still a little bit tricky to figure out the hierarchy here in a sense. Is the European Convention then on the same level as the other rights expressed in our constitutional documents? Or is it superior or possibly is it inferior? You can argue basically all three positions. And it's not exactly clear, but I'll get back to that a little bit more. The other thing that happened on January 1st, 1995, was that Sweden joined the European Union. Um, I was, I'm, I'm old enough to remember what, 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 what the, the process leading up to this, and I, I actually got to participate in the election, almost. By, I, I was only a few months too long to vote whether we should join the European Union. Uh, but at the time, Swedish politicians were saying that joining the European Union won't mean very much. It's not going to be a very radical change. It's mostly about the free movement of goods, goods being services moving around more freely, which will basically mean cheaper meat. That, that was more or less the, 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 the summary of what joining the European Union would be. It wouldn't be so different. I think now, 22 years later, it has meant a lot more than that. It has been a quite radical change. Um, there are many things that are contained in European Union uh, and in the European Union law, and this is one of my main fields of study and teaching. And I could I could talk European Union law all day, uh, but I'm going to try to focus a little bit about the protection of fundamental rights inside the European Union. One very fundamental right, and I, I would still refer to it as a fundamental right, even though it is not a traditional human right, is the uh, fundamental uh, rights to free movement. This is a very particularly European Union thing. So when the European Union was created, I don't know if you know how, what, what you know about the European Union. I'll just assume that you don't know too much. And, and you can tell me to stop talking if this is all. Um, but, but the European Union was created 
it was a peace process project in a sense after World War II. There was the idea, particularly among the Benelux countries, Germany, France, and Italy, that we should integrate the countries more. The idea is very basically expressed that if countries are closely integrated, they don't go to war with each other. Uh, it fosters understanding and it creates dependencies that, that are costly to break and therefore don't, you don't want to go to war in a sense. One of the, the core ideas here is economic integration, so to integrate the economies of the member states. So it's very economic focused. And in this regard, the European Union is very similar to a lot of other free trade associations, like, for example, the North American NAFTA Association, uh, which, is, which is also a free trade association, not entirely dissimilar. I know there, there is a South American one. Is there a free trade association that Nepal is part of? SEFTA? Okay, free trade SEFTA. Maybe, maybe it is a little bit similar to the European Union, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that much about it, I must admit. Uh, but so the core uh, of the, the, the cooperation among the member states is to create free trade uh, and free movement. So there's free movement of goods, free movement of services, free movement of persons, particularly, originally, free movements of workers, because workers are an economic factor, and free movement of capital. So it's very economically focused. But these rights can also be used for all other kinds of of, of things. And in many instances, particularly the free movement of persons, have evolved into a fundamental right for people. The right for people to move between different member states. And this also comes with many other things. So it comes to the right for education for my children. It comes to the right for like social support if I cannot support myself. And many other rights that are, are, are co coupled with these traditional fundamental freedoms. So these are quite strong. These, these are a per very particular type of fundamental rights, and I would, we would, I, I could not anymore distinguish them from other types of human rights, even though they're not universal human rights in the sense that, that they are recognized in most other members uh, in most other countries. But then we also have the question of protection of other type, if we say like more traditional human rights and fundamental rights. And this has been a big conflict inside the European Union for quite some time. It started actually with uh, the problem of uh, the member states wanting to ensure that the European Union respected fundamental rights. Because there was nothing in the treaties that established the European Union that expressly said that people enjoy ordinary traditional human rights. It does say that they enjoy these fundamental freedoms, free movement rights but not other type of rights, for example, the right to property. And for many, many member states, this was a very sore point. This was very problematic, particularly in Germany. And the German uh, uh, Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Constitutional Court of Germany, the federal Constitutional Court, uh, has had many different cases where they address this problem, that how do we make sure that the, that the EU laws respect these fundamental rights? And for them, this, is a, this becomes a very important point because they're basically saying, if you don't respect these rights, we don't have to respect your laws. And if, if the member state don't have to respect EU laws, the whole thing comes crumbling down. Right? So the European Court of Justice early on established said, the EU law is supreme to national law. There's the principle of supremacy. And the German court says, well, we don't know if we can accept that if you don't respect fundamental rights. Because we can then end up in a very tricky situation where we have, for example, a regulation coming from the EU that we have to enforce. And in doing so, we would then violate the fundamental rights that are so important in Germany. I, I, Germany has a very special relationship to this because after World War II, after the atrocities of World War II, Germany started a new, with a new constitution with very strong protection for human rights. So they are, in a sense, the member state of the European Union for whom fundamental rights matters the most, I would say. I think all member states take human rights seriously, but it's particularly serious in Germany. Um, and this, this, all, this came to uh, head in a case called Internationale Handelsgesellschaft. It's a rather long word, which basically means international uh, uh, like company or something like trading, international trading company. And it gave rise to what I refer to as the Internationale Handelsgesellschaft Compromise, which is even longer. 
Um, but, but it's a compromise. The European Court of Justice enters a compromise with the member states. So the background of the case, I'll just quickly tell you about Internationale Handelsgesellschaft. It's fun to say, isn't it? Uh, so in this case, it, it was a very, very boring case with very, very boring facts. <laughs> it, it was about a German company, Internationale Handelsgesellschaft, who had, uh, they wanted to export wheat, I think, wheat and grains and other things like this. And uh, in order to do so, they had to buy an export license. And then there was an EU system for this. So there was a, a, a law that came down from the EU legislative uh, bodies that said how this worked. And so they paid money to get one of these export licenses. After the year was at end, they hadn't been able to export this much grain. They then wanted their money back. And the, the, the German government, the German uh, official said, we can't because there's nothing in the EU law that allows us to give you your money back. Like basically we buy these licenses. And the company, Internationale Handelsgesellschaft, then said, doesn't this violate my right to property? Because uh, you basically have now, I have, you have basically stolen money from me. You made me pay for these licenses in advance. If you don't give me money back, you've basically taken my property. And they said, we think you have a point. Under German law, probably you would be allowed to get this money back. But the problem is, it's not our law. It's an EU law, right? You understand the conflict. So the, the, the German constitution, the basic law of Germany, uh, uh, granted them a, a, a basic human right. And they said, but we don't know if we can use this. So they went to the European Court of Justice, or the Court of Justice of the European Union, as it's now called. Uh, and they asked them, what should we do? Because we have a problem here. We can either enforce the fundamental rights of Germany, but then we would basically say that they take precedence over EU law. And we know you don't like that. Or we can apply the EU regulation, but that would violate the basic laws of Germany, and we're not going to do that, because we don't even have the power to do that. But our constitution is very clear. This takes precedence over anything. How should we solve this? And the court then offers a compromise. They say, the supremacy of EU law is, is absolute. Every single type of EU law, including this very boring regulation about wheat export uh, licenses, take precedence over all national law, including the most fundamental human rights protected in the German constitution. It is absolute. However, they say, we will protect fundamental rights as part of EU law. And there's nothing in the EU treaties that talk about this. This is basically created by the European Court of Justice in this instance. They basically says, surely the member states must have meant, when they created this union, they must have also meant that we were supposed to protect the common constitutional tradition of Europe. So that is something that they, they refer to and they say, so any type of, of right uh, that is part of the common constitutional European tradition, whatever that is, that's a very loose term, but whatever that is, is also part of EU law, and we can then say this EU law regulation can be set aside because it violates this, this common tradition. And this is a compromise. They basically import e the, the, European, the constitutional rights from the member states into the EU system. And from that day on, it's been very clear that the EU law contains this kind of protection. In Internationale Handelsgesellschaft, it was a question about the member states using these rights against the EU. It's about Germany <coughs> wanting to make sure that the EU respects the rights that are protected under German law. Over time, this has been flipped around. So they say, well, if you have to respect EU law, you also have to respect the fundamental laws that are protected in EU law, right? So it cuts both ways. If, if you, you have now convinced us that there are fundamental rights protection in EU law, but that also means that you have to respect this. But this creates a little bit of a complicated situation. Because there are, there are two problems. The first question is, what are these rights then? Because it's not exactly just the own constitutional laws of each member state. It is the common, constitu the common constitutional traditions of all member states. So it's like the common core, if you will, of, of the member states' constitutions. 
So for example, the Swedish right to information that I talked about is a very special Swedish constitutional right. That is probably not part of the rights protected as a fundamental right under EU law. I don't know for certain because it has never been addressed in the European Court of Justice whether it is or it isn't. But probably, I would say probably not because Sweden has a very strong, extensively strong protection for these kind of rights compared to the other member states. However, for example, all rights that are protected in the European Convention of Human Rights are definitely part of this, this body of rights that are protected under EU law. Because every member state, like we said earlier, every single member state has to sign on to, to, the, to the convention in order to be a member of the European Union. So this is very strong protection in this sense. And then there is also more rights into this. These things have no, now been codified into the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So today there is actually a document that explains what these, what these rights are. But this is quite recent. This was in 2009. Uh, and it's been going on for quite some time. Um, as I said earlier, I mentioned earlier, there is in the European Union, there's a court, the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is the highest court in the European Union, but it's not, the, it's not a supreme court, in a sense, of the, uh, the member states. So it's not that you can, can appeal all your, your cases to the European uh, Court of Justice, uh, instead, it is a court. Most cases are still decided by the national courts. Uh, the national courts still sort of function as, as, as their own courts and the only courts, and in most cases, are the only courts where you can go. But on matters that involve EU law, you can also invoke EU law in front of these courts. So, not Swedish courts all both, both deal with like traditional Swedish law, like most importantly the legislative acts taken by the parliament in Stockholm, but they also enforce the laws that are being established down in Brussels by the European Union. Um, whenever a case involves something relating to EU law, the fundamental rights under EU law apply. But when the case does not involve EU law, the fundamental rights under EU law does not apply. So let me give you an example, because that is probably not completely obvious what that is. Um, take, for example, in contract law. Contract law is normally not governed or regulated by the EU. So in most contract disputes, you have no issue under EU law. There are no EU legislation or anything like that. And so the member states are not bound by the fundamental rights under EU law. They are only bound by whatever ordinary they would be under national law. Uh, but if this dispute involves uh, free movement of goods, which is a part of EU law, let's say it's a contract about the sale of goods between Sweden and Denmark. Now there is EU law involved here, right? Now there might be an EU law issue. And then the fundamental rights apply. And this becomes a very peculiar situation because you could have two almost identical cases, let's say two contract disputes being settled by the same Swedish court in southern Sweden. One involving two parties both from southern Sweden and one case involving one part from southern Sweden and one that is just 30 minutes away in Denmark on the other side of the border and two different sets of fundamental rights apply in these cases. And this is rather strange, right, because it now becomes a situation where your fundamental rights, what kind of protection you have for fundamental rights are dependent on rather uh, circumstances that are not very important. These very small factual differences can make a huge difference in what kind of human rights protection you have and in which kind of courts you can go to and what kind of remedies you can have. So that is one complication of this. And we have seen this in uh, a few cases, some, some hard cases uh, that, that can be mentioned. Um, one important case that was, was a little bit tricky to figure out uh, was the Kadi al Barakat case. This came after the events of 9-11 uh, in the United States. After the 9-11 incident, the United Nations Security Council issued a list of ex uh, suspected uh, terrorists. And uh, the EU then issued a regulation saying that the, that the properties of all these suspected um, terrorists should be seized. They should they, all their bank accounts, all their other properties needs to be seized. 
to prevent further uh, types of crimes. Uh, very good. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, they entered a, a regulation that all these assets need to be seized. One of these uh, individuals, Kadi, and one of these associations that were created, Al Baraka, were uh, in Sweden at the time. And uh, Swedish public authorities enforced the EU regulation and they seized their properties, taking all their money, basically, uh, freezing their assets so that they couldn't use them. Uh, they then went and complained to the courts and said that this violates my, my right to property, right? And we know since Internationale Handelsgesellschaft that I have a right to property under EU law. And this is one of these situations that became quite complicated because on one hand the EU felt compelled that they have to follow the, the resolution of the, the security, UN Security Council. Sweden felt compelled that it had to respect a regulation by the EU, but at the same time, they were also arguing like there are fundamental rights here, including fundamental rights protected by EU itself, that would be violated if we enforce this. And um, the European Court of Justice said, yes, actually, we have to have some kind of system. We can't just enforce the UN uh, regulation by itself. I will skip those other kind of uh, questions and move. Uh, I move ahead a little bit. So what we have today, because we now have joined after January first, nineteen ninety-five, Sweden has what I call here uh, a plural, a constitutional pluralism. We have basically three sets of constitutional systems, or three constitutions. Very simply, we have our traditional old Swedish constitution which is based on the principles of popular sovereignty and uh, fundamental, the, the liberal freedoms, as we spoke about, strong parliamentarism, these are, are the fundamental principles. And then we have European Convention of Human Rights, which is more broad, that is only focusing on, on uh, fundamental rights, that is enforced by the court in Strasbourg. Um, and then we have the EU legal order that has many different interests, that have many different things, but that includes protection of human rights that are mostly going above. It uses basically the European Convention as a type of baseline because that is part of the European, uh, the common constitutional tradition of the member states, but it then goes beyond that and includes other things as well. Uh, it also includes the fundamental free movement rights, the free movement of goods and persons and so, that is additional to this. The European Convention of Human Rights all applies in basically all situations in Sweden, alongside with our own old constitution, but sometimes we get these kind of conflicts, like between um, information and privacy, between uh, parliamentary sovereignty and, and uh, uh, property rights. But so so it, it, it differs a little bit, but there are these kind of con conflicts. We have different kinds of conflicts between Swedish, traditional Swedish constitutional law and EU fundamental rights, and but they only apply in some cases, not in all cases. The same is actually true with the, the uh, convention, that there are some situations where there, there are certain types of, you don't always have the same kind of rights, depending if the convention is applicable. Uh, this also means that we have basically three sets of courts we have that are in charge of this. The, the Luxembourg Court, the Strasbourg Court, and our highest courts in Stockholm. And these are basically all fighting this out. And in, in largely speaking, we can say we don't know who wins and when they win and what they win. We don't know exactly who takes supremacy or primacy take precedence, and I say, whose opinion takes precedence over the other ones? Each court says, we, we are the one that ultimately decides. So all three courts may claim to be the highest courts. That can obviously not be exactly true. Um, there are different types of arguments why, why you, could, you could make an argument for all of the three courts in a sense, and why they should take precedence in one way or another. But, but ultimately, it's not, it's not resolved. And so it's a little bit the situation in Sweden, which is the same in most other European member states, I would say. We have more or less the same view. It's, it's a kind of stalemate. So uh, this has been expressed also in the, um, 
in the, uh, the, uh, by the German Bundesverfassungsgericht, the, the, the highest constitutional court of Germany, uh, as the Solange uh, doctrine. Solange means as long as in German. And, and it, it, it's a, so we will respect what you're saying as long as dot dot dot. Right? So there is a little bit of a threat there. <laughs> saying, you know, we will, we will respect, we will assume that you're doing, you know, everything you can and that the laws that you pass are in compliance with all fundamental rights. There is a presumption that all is well and we don't need a showdown. However, <laughs> right, if that's the dot dot dot, we will, in exceptional circumstances, exercise our power to overrule you. If we find that there's a problem here, if you are violating fundamental principles and general rights that we have in our constitution that are truly fundamental, we will step in and stop. We are the ultimate guardians. And most likely that, that is the best way to explain the, the current situation. So we have three different legal orders that are all making claims of, of being the top dog in this system and being the ones that ultimately gets to decide. But in the end, the Strasbourg Court and the Luxembourg Court, they don't have a local police force. and They don't have local enforcement agencies, which local courts do. National courts actually do this. And the local police will probably follow a national judgment and not a Luxembourg judgment or a Strasbourg judgment. So if the, these highest courts in Stockholm step in and says, enough is enough, we're going to step in, that is probably what happens. There's a case at the bottom there, I use, that I will use as an example of when this happened. This happened in December, uh, on December 5th, I believe, 2016, so less than five months ago. Uh, in Denmark, this is a Danish case, but they basically could, it could have happened in Sweden. So the European Court of Justice has said uh, that one of the fundamental rights of European Union law is the right not to be discriminated against on grounds of age. So you cannot have age discrimination. You have to treat people equally regardless of age. And this is a fundamental right that the member states must uphold. So in the case of Ayus, the facts were that an employer had a, um, he had been uh, laying off people. He had a lot of people employed. It was a large company. They fired a lot of people and uh, they simply didn't need them anymore. They didn't do anything wrong, but there were no need for their services anymore. The company was shrinking. And um, under Danish law at the time, the, the national Danish law said if the uh, person is older than 55, you can give them uh, a three-month pay. Uh, you, you don't have to give them a three-month pay because they now have a right to pension. So under Danish law, if you were 55 years old and you were laid off, you can just simply become a pensioner, which is quite generous in a sense. And uh, so the, the Danish law says if you're younger than 55 and you're being laid off, the employer have to pay you three months' salary so that you can that you have money while you go and find a new job. But you don't have to pay the money to people that are older than 55 because they can just become pensioners, right? They were already taken care of. So one of these employees. Uh, that were being laid off. He was older than 55, but he wanted to keep on working. He could have become a pensioner, but he didn't want to become a pensioner. And so he went to the employer and said, I don't want to become a pensioner. Uh, I'd like to keep on working, but I'd like three months' pay so that I can have money while I go and look for a job. And the employer said, he said, look at Danish law. Uh, we don't have to give you this. We're not going to give you this money. So he argued, went to the Danish court and says, this is age discrimination. I, have, I am protected under your European Union law against age discrimination. Um, and this, the, the Court of Justice of the European Union agreed with him. He said, they said, yes, this is age discrimination. Danish courts, you must order the Danish employer to pay three months' salaries. Right? So it was very clear. It went back to the Danish Supreme Court, Hösterer, and they said, no, we won't do it. He said, we've understood what you said. It's very clear. You say EU law requires us to order the employer to pay the employee money. We will not do it because that would violate the fundamental rights of the employer. The employer has been relying on Danish law. It was very clear in Danish law. He didn't have to pay this money. If we were to order him, it would be the same thing as retroactively applying this law and taking his money uh, based on a retroactive law. We will not do that. We just simply refuse. And this is an example where they, where we see a very clear conflict, right? 
between the, and it's also a conflict between different fundamental rights. It's the fundamental right against age discrimination, against the right of the property, and the protection against retroactive legislation on behalf of the employer. The, the Court of Justice of the European Union weighs these in favor of age discrimination. They say, well, it doesn't matter. It's more important to protect people against age discrimination. The Danish court says, no, nope, we did the other thing. And we don't know what happened. So far, nothing has happened. Everybody pretends like, like everything is fine. Because nobody really wants a showdown. You don't really want to find out who is the top dog. I don't think the European Court of Justice is particularly interested in, in pushing this. Because maybe they could find Denmark, but then they would get a bigger revolt, in a sense. Because this is one of these cases. Sulange, this is as long as this is a point where that point has been breached. And, and the Danish courts will not enforce the new law. And I think we won't see anything happen. I think they will go about with business as usual. And, and I think that that is an illustration of how this works. So I'm going to try to a little bit sort of sum up all, all of these things that we talked about. Uh, Sweden has had a very weak constitutional rules. We have a rather weak constitutional tradition, at least leading up until 1995. There wasn't very much protection at all. We didn't have much of a tradition of protecting fundamental rights legally. In practice, it was quite good, maybe even very good. If you look at various types of institutions that measure human rights violation, it was very rare that human rights were actually violated in Sweden. So the public authorities had a very strong tradition, and it goes back, you can argue, for, for more than 700 years. The, 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 the public authorities had a tradition of, of, of respecting individuals' human rights, even though it wasn't really established in law, even though the courts were not very strong in enforcing any of these rights. Um, so this is, this is a little bit strange, in a sense. Uh, the Swedish system protects very little legal protection against the tyranny of the majority. Meaning the majority can basically do whatever they want to the minority, legally speaking. And that is the way the entire constitutional system is set up. We could, um, we have an election next year, so if we like now start changing our constitutional arguments, we could possibly remove all human rights within, a, a, sing a single majority of parliament could remove all human rights protection within about a year and a half, realistically speaking. Uh, it hasn't happened. It seems very unlikely that it will happen. How, 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 then, how then can this system work in a sense? I think so, a lot of people says that uh, maybe we are too naive. We've been very lucky. Sweden has had a, a uh, strong democratic development. We have uh, had a great deal of homogeneity in our society. People have had a um, we have a, a lot of sort of similar ethnic backgrounds, more or less. There's been a lot of people moving within Scandinavia, but, but it's still a rather limited um, uh, heterogeneity among the population. We haven't had large conflicts between different religious groups, have not historically been a big problem. More recently, if you look at Sweden after World War II, we've had a lot of equality and prosperity, economic prosperity. But this wasn't always the case. This is quite recent. When my grandmother was born, people were quite poor. They were people starving to death in, in Sweden in the early 20th century. It isn't that Sweden has always had great income equality or wealth equality or that we've always been wealthy. This is a rather new thing in Sweden. It is in the second half of the 20th century that, that Sweden became wealthy. And even before that, there was very strong protection of these rights. Um, there is, however, a, a possibly an older culture of what I would call consensus and pragmatism. This, this is a lot of people that visit Sweden, I think, find this, that, that we are very consensus driven and we're very pragmatic. We had a talk earlier before I came here with some of the people and the fact that they are saying, we, the, the, our, in our university nobody decides. It's basically every, we have titles. People are professors, and people are deans, and people are presidents, and so on. But in reality, it's very consensus-based. And, and we basically talk until we all agree. 
<laughs> that's, it's a very, and it's, it's usually a very uh, open discourse, you know, it's a respectful but very open discourse about different things. And usually we come to some kind of consensus. Then usually someone has to sign the, the decision. But it's very, very rare in Sweden that people make a decision and just say, well, I am the boss, I decide, I write, you know, I decide what goes here. And it wouldn't be very tolerated in Sweden. If you try to run a company and says, well, I own the company, therefore I decide what the company does. That kind of attitude wouldn't work very well in the Swedish corporation. And I know that in many parts of the world that is exactly how it works. But there's a, there, that, that, that is a general culture that I think permeates the entire society. I think this is true for Swedish family life too. That, that the parents usually try to come to a consensus for their children. You know, when you're saying, where are we going to go, uh, what are we going to do for, for our holiday this summer, right? When we talk about it, we reach some kind of consensus. And the parents have a little bit more sway, we can speak with a little bit more authority, but, but it's, it's, it's not simply one person is the boss and the boss says goes. And I think this helps. I think this helps in these kind of ways. The other thing we have is a culture of pragmatism. We're not very principled people. I think we can often say, well, the, the important thing is not the principle or the theory. The important thing is that we, we get it done in a sense. I've noticed this at the universities when we have some people coming in from other countries. And they say, well, I'd like to speak about the theory of this or the theory of that. And, and I think a lot of my people well, do we even need a theory? What, what, what is the point of the theory? We'd like to go to the problem and say, what, what kind of problem are we solving here? Let's start with a problem and, and we, let's talk about that. And if we need a theory in order to solve the problem, fine. But we don't need theories to have theories, in a sense. Um, and I think this also helps. This is the, one of the explanations, I think, why we were able to basically not have a constitution that was even close to our constitutional reality for almost a century. Where we kept on saying, well, on paper it looks like the king has all the power, but that's not actually how we do it. We agree, everyone, we have a very strong consensus. Uh, we don't have any protection for human rights, but we have all agreed that we're going to protect it anyway. We've all agreed that it's going to be part of our culture and very strongly protected. And, and this actually works. When it doesn't work, of course, is if something happens. As long as we have, we have a very strong trust in government, we have a very strong trust in each other. This is probably connected to the other things. That, that because we have a consensus culture and a pragmatic culture, because we are quite egalitarian and, and homogenous, we, it works quite well. But what happens if something starts threatening that? And I think this is a situation where we are now a little bit, people are rethinking this. Maybe we have been too naive. What happens if we really do, like in many countries in Europe now, there's a little bit more of a rise of, uh, of the right, there's a little bit more of a rise against um, uh, immigration. They were saying maybe we need to curtail some of these rights. Uh, we've seen this in some of the countries. You can argue that maybe with the re most recent elections in the Netherlands, Finland, and France, maybe it's stepping back, maybe it's not just escalating and escalating, but we don't know. Um, but, but people are basically saying maybe this is a situation where we need to think about how law can ensure the respect for human rights in the long run, and other types of important constitutional principles too. But maybe we need more legal protection for constitutional rights and the protection of the minority against the, the major, tyranny of the majority. Thank you very much. like Sweden, which has been standing at the top of the notch. I also talked to the professor earlier um, um, in crucial human rights issues like anti-corruption and clean environment. And um, this particular session is very much informative for us because you not only highlighted the highest scores of Sweden, but also talked about paradoxes um, uh, in which Sweden has been stumbling on. We are very much inspired to learn from it both successes and paradoxes, and um, it's certainly going to be an asset for us students in our pathways to human rights and constitutional law. Thank you so much, Professor. We would like to express our gratitude with a huge round of applause.